Hi, welcome to the Priestnall History Hub. Uh, this video is all about tensions in Berlin in between 1958 and 1961. So why was Berlin still a problem by 1958? By 1957, Khrushchev, who was now the leader of the Soviet Union, had several issues concerning West Germany. Not only had West Germany joined NATO in 1955, but it also joined the European Economic Community, kind of like the predecessor to the EU by 1957. West Germany was clearly economically strong and growing more so by the day. Additionally, Khrushchev also saw West Germany as a military threat. The Soviet fear of another German invasion wouldn't go away. In the years before 1961, Khrushchev attempted to persuade the Allies to voluntarily leave West Berlin. He wanted the Allies out because West Berlin was an area of capitalist wealth and a symbol of the success of Western Europe, in stark contrast to the poverty of Eastern Communist Berlin and Germany. Furthermore, the USSR also claimed that the USA and its allies used West Berlin as a base for espionage, which basically means spying. The Soviets argued that they needed to control uh, the movement and access into Berlin in order to stop this spying from taking place. So the refugee problem in Berlin, what was this and why was it a problem? Between 1949 and 1961, about 4 million East Germans fled to the West through Berlin because they were dissatisfied with the economical and political conditions at home. Stalin had forced all farming to be collectivised, which means that all farms were given over to the state in East Germany, exactly as he had done in Russia inside the Soviet Union. Also, Stalin had banned all private trading. This was not the way that Eastern German people were used to living. This was communism and many people hated it. Furthermore, there was also a shortage of consumer goods. These were cheaper in West Berlin and also food shortages. Most of this was caused by strikes from East Berlin workers who were furious about the extreme quotas that they had been given by the East German government, who were essentially a puppet government being controlled by the USSR. East Berlin protesters even demanded a removal of the Eastern German government. This was brutally put down and the police and Soviet troops fired on the crowd, killing 55 people. From January 1961, the number of refugees leaving East Berlin for the West increased rapidly to more than 20,000 a month. What's more, many of the refugees that had left were professional people and skilled craftsmen, so with a skill in their job. Uh, this was a massive drain of labour that could bring about the economic collapse of Eastern Germany. This was known as the brain drain. Khrushchev was determined to solve the Berlin problem. He called Berlin a fishbone stuck in his throat, suggesting that Berlin was a capitalist door that needed closing. So Khrushchev's Berlin ultimatum, what was it and why did he issue it? On November the 10th, 1958, Khrushchev issued something called the Berlin ultimatum. He accused the Allies of breaking the Potsdam Agreement and told them that they were to leave Berlin within six months. He has also suggested, um, sorry, he also suggested that Berlin should become a reunited, neutral free city. President Eisenhower was prepared to negotiate and didn't want to risk a war over Berlin. That said, he believed that they only uh, was to protect the freedom of West Berlin was to keep a US presence there. Khrushchev visited the USA in the summer of 1959, and it was hoped that a summit meeting could be held the following year. This was due to be held in Paris. So what actually happened at this Paris summit in 1960? Khrushchev and Eisenhower were due to meet in Paris on the 14th of May 1960. However, nine days before the summit conference was due to open, the Soviet Union announced that it had shot down an American U-2 spy plane over the Soviet Union. The pilot was captured and was put on trial. His name was Gary Powers. Khrushchev was furious and demanded that all such flights stop and that the USA give, give an apology for spying. Eisenhower was prepared to stop the flights, but he wouldn't apologise. Uh, there were bitter exchanges between the two leaders at the first meeting, which ended with Khrushchev storming out of the meeting. Subsequently, Eisenhower cancelled his planned visit to the Soviet Union and the summit did not take place. So there's another summit in Vienna in 1961. 
By the summer of 61, the USA had a new president, John F. Kennedy. Khrushchev hoped an agreement could now be made and so fixed another date for a different summit meeting in Vienna. Khrushchev felt confident that he would be able to push around the young, newly elected president. He had underestimated Kennedy, who had made it clear from the beginning that he believed in the Truman Doctrine. By June 1961, both leaders met in Vienna in Austria. Khrushchev again demanded that Western forces leave West Berlin within six months. He said if they didn't leave, then he would make an agreement with East Germany, who the USSR pretty much controlled anyway, which would end all access rights for the Allies into East Germany. By doing so, this would by default cut off all access for the Allies into Western Berlin. Remember that Berlin was located within East Germany, so it's like a little island floating in East Germany that the Soviets controlled. Kennedy stood his ground and refused to withdraw Western forces. In fact, he even increased US defence spending by $3.5 billion the following month. In turn, in July, Khrushchev announced that the Soviet defence budget would also be increased by more than 30%. Tensions over Berlin had hit an all-time high by August 1961. So the ultimate conclusion to this was the construction of the Berlin Wall in 1961. The differences over Berlin worsened. On the 13th of August, Khrushchev closed the border between East and West Berlin. Streets near to the border between the East and West were torn up by East German troops so that they could put a barbed wire fence, which was 27 miles long, around their eastern part of Berlin. The USA and the Allies did nothing to stop the building of the wall because the new barrier was put up within the boundary of East Berlin. So Khrushchev was using territory within the East. He didn't touch the territory of West Berlin. Within a few days, they started to build the wall itself, as well as a chain of fences and minefields. An area was cleared so that East German guards would be able to shoot at any East Germans who tried to cross over West Berlin. Eventually, East German officials replaced the temporary wall with one that was much stronger. The new wall was 3.6 metres high and 1.2 metres wide, which made it very difficult to climb over. The area beyond the wall was almost impossible to get across because it included patrolling soldiers and dogs, as well as floodlights and tripwire machine guns. So here's some pictures that show you just how wide the wall was. It's like a wall within a wall. So a photo taken from the west side of the wall, the bit in between the wall and the barbed wire on the other side, was known as No Man's Land, and later the Death Strip. The Berlin Wall was actually, as I've just said, a wall within another wall. The Death Strip was covered with rake sand or gravel, making footprints easy to notice, easing the detection of trespassers and also enabling officers to see which guards had neglected their task. It offered no cover and most importantly it offered clear fields of fire for the wall guards. So what was the impact of the wall for relations between the US and the Soviet Union? The construction of the wall led to a serious standoff between the two superpowers in October 1961 The USA disputed the right of Soviet troops to patrol and guard the checkpoints to the wall, as well as to check the passports of American officials who passed through these checkpoints. The Americans stationed their own troops and tanks on the western side of the checkpoints, which in turn provoked the Soviets to place tanks on the East German side. One wrong move and there was a real possibility of armed conflict. The US President Kennedy worked behind the scenes to avoid any such conflict promising Khrushchev that if the Soviet Union removed its troops, the US would do the same, and this therefore ended the standoff. So what was the impact for Germans? After the building of the Berlin Wall, escape from east to west Germany became very difficult. Some people managed to defect by tunnelling, so tunnelling underneath, Uh, some by swimming where the border ran along Berlin's Telto Canal, and others by jumping out of windows near to the wall. Some managed to climb the wall, hoping that East German guards would deliberately take poor aim when offered to fire at them. But many people lost their lives trying to cross from east to west in the years of the Berlin Wall. Whilst those living on the west could literally walk up to the wall and touch it, it was very different for those living on the east side of Berlin. The building of the wall meant that peace was maintained at a high price for the German people. Families were split as some lived in the east and some in the west and travel restrictions made it very difficult for relatives to see one another. The wall therefore literally tore families apart 
and Germans also felt let down because despite all of Kennedy's rage, he still had not gone to war or done anything wrong at all. So was this the end of the Berlin crisis? Khrushchev interpreted the construction of the wall in two ways. He felt that he had beaten Kennedy um, and was prepared for the next chance to outmaneuver his rival. The flow of refugees was stopped and the economic crisis East Germany was facing slowly evaporated. Khrushchev said that the wall was guarding the gates of the socialist paradise. Although Khrushchev had failed to remove Western forces from Berlin, the crisis ended and the tension in Europe was eased. So, as a final note, I want to talk about Kennedy's visit to Berlin. So, the war became the symbol of division in the world, and for Berliners, it was a constant reminder that their country was still a tool of the superpowers. Kennedy actually visited West Germany in 1963, and he made several speeches in major cities, where he was met by huge cheering crowds. When he moved on to West Berlin, he embarked on a 30-mile tour of the main street, which aligned with 1.5 million West Germans when the total population was 2.5 million. So that was a lot of Germany that came to see him. He spoke to a crowd of about 200,000 in the city centre, near the wall, and gave what would be a famous speech about the free world. He famously uttered the words, Ich bin ein Berliner, where he meant to say, I am a Berliner, but his poor grasp of German meant he actually said in German, I am a pastry. So outside of Berlin, I'm Berliner is a bit like a jam donut. OK, don't forget to subscribe to Personal History Hub and the next video is going to be on crisis over Cuba.